All right, welcome back to the ICED conference of 2021 and our fifth keynote. This next speaker is extra fun for me to present as we can uh, proudly count him as a Chalmers alumnus and uh, he has a PhD from here and uh, we have been so excited to see his continuing career path because it's a very adventurous one and one that points to a very positive direction. This is, this is the uh, founder and CEO of Heart Aerospace. I welcome to the stage Dr. Anders Forslund. Thank you so much. It's my absolute honor to be here. Um, so, as Essie said, my name is Anders Forslund and I'm the founder and CEO of Heart Aerospace. And we're a company that builds regional electric planes. Can I get my slides here? That's. Perfect. So uh, now I see them. Perfect. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our pathway that we believe is, you know, heading towards uh, commercial electric air travel, and it's going to be about a pathway in general towards that, and also about our company's pathway towards it, but also a little bit of my, my personal personal pathway towards it. So we're a company based here in Gothenburg. Um, we're located on. We, uh, at Seava Airport, which is uh, a few kilometers from here, where we have our offices in Hangar. And we're in a period of our company of quite uh, expansive growth. So from a company that started in 2018, and we're only two people in the summer of 2019, so like two years ago, uh, we've grown so that now we're 54 employees that are currently signed on to this company. So it's uh, been a dr dramatic transformation for us. And it's mostly, uh, partly fueled by our big announcement that we made a few months ago, where we announced that we've actually uh, secured a large uh, investment round from Breakthrough Energy Ventures, which is uh, a very influential climate fund that was funded by Bill Gates after the Paris Agreement, as well as an investment and an order from United Airlines, and, uh, and, uh, which is one of the largest airlines in the world, and Mesa Airlines, which is one of the largest regional airlines in the world, for 200 aircraft. So uh, this is obviously a very transformational period for our company, and I'm going to start, start actually a little bit by talking about how we got here. So how did we get started? Or, um, so first of all, as Ceci mentioned, uh, this is actually the second time I speak at an ICED conference, or actually I'm attending an ICED conference, because I was at ICED 13 in Seoul when I was part of this uh, sort of product development group at Chalmers. Uh, this is me back then. I still have a white shirt, uh, different pants, look younger as well, and, and, and with no worries in the world. Um, but um, this, being a part of this society or being part of this, doing your PhD in this was actually very formative to me, not only because I sort of learned what I was writing my PhD about, which was about robust design and multidisciplinary design optimization, but also that I got to learn to use all of these tools that are actually quite hard to get hands on uh, for, for CAD or a finite element analysis, uh, computational fluid dynamics, and also that I got this sort of design thinking and design strategy. We do trips to places like Seoul, but also to Japan to visit Toyota and to, uh, to Silicon Valley to visit some of the companies there. And I think I, it was sort of very, very inspiring uh, place to be. And it's also something that sort of sparked an interest in me of actually you know, applying this knowledge. Like, what am I going to do with all the stuff that I learned? Um, and after, after uh, I said actually, just a few weeks after I, I moved to MIT for a research exchange, and this was in the middle of you know, when the electrification revolution was really taking off, and drones were becoming a thing, and you'd have people, people like Elon Musk would show up at, at, at um, MIT and talk about, you know, electric planes and all of this stuff. And I was, it, like, when I got home from that experience, and when I did my PhD in 2016, I was sort of convinced of two things. And one of them was that, uh, you know, electrification is coming to aviation. And I want to be a part of it. And the other one was that it's not going to happen in Sweden, so I have to go elsewhere. So I spent, like I started after PhD still working here at Chalmers, but I spent a lot of time applying for a job at one of these cool sort of new uh, startups that were trying to build flying cars. So I, I spent, uh, you know, there was so much, it was such an explosion around this. And I identified a few companies that I wanted to work for, and I started implementing, you know, the theories and the things that I worked and wrote very, very intricate 
job applications where I'd actually like, I'd build a model of your plane and I've simulated this and that. I even went to the stage of actually like printing models and testing them at the Shalmers wind tunnel. And I was, I think, they, I think it was a little bit like over, uh, over, uh, I think they thought I was kind of crazy, the people that were receiving my, my job applications because I was, you know, writing, writing this, doing all of this stuff. And it eventually became you know, more of an excuse, these job applications, because I became so involved in these design processes. Uh, but in the middle of all this focus on what was happening in the other, other parts of the world, something happened that really changed the trajectory. And that was that Norway, our neighboring country, announced that they want all short haul flights to be 100% electric by 2040. And while there was a lot of activity, there was hundreds of companies, startups and large companies working on these flying cars, there was nobody really building a product for that Scandinavian market, or for that Nor uh, market in Norway. And like a week after this news article was printed, we actually submitted an ap application for a research project, a pre-study here at Chalmers called Elise Electric Aviation in Sweden, where we wanted to study, like, okay, what are we doing in Sweden about this? And we started, actually, it was a very, very good process for us because we, we got to ask not only like looking at this with this cool new technology but also understanding why do we need electric planes and something came up to us that we thought was very striking so we identified these three challenges that regional air travel is facing the first one is that it's not very profitable to fly on a regional uh, airline or, and to operate a regional airline uh, in 2019, Nextjet was one of the big operators in Sweden. Went filed for bankruptcy, and it was even you know before COVID there was a lot of a lot of sort of uh, uncertainty, and it came to regional air travel. This was affecting connectivity. A lot of airports were m an infrastructure that's actually already there. That's very you know very prime, pristine. It's not being used. Uh, maybe it's not being used at all, or sometimes it's being used once a day to fly to places like Stockholm. So in Stockholm, which is the hub of Sweden, that's where all the flights go. Uh, they have the opposite problem of congestion, and they have to think about expanding runways, etc. And last but not least, there's climate. And this was really the big thing, and it continues to be even bigger. But in 2019, uh, oh, first of all, I mean, you all know the science about this, so I didn't, don't need to preach about it. But, uh, it, you know, this is happening. We're, we're coming out of a, the w w hottest summer on record. And, um, and aviation is about 2 to 3% of this, just in CO2. And it's growing exponentially due to the fact that it's only about 20% of the world's population that has flown. So it's growing about about 5% every year. And it's projected by 2050, it'll be closer to 20% of global CO2 emissions. Um, and aviation has also become a symbol in Sweden of, of sort of bad practices for, 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 um, for emissions where, with, the, with the concept of flygskam flight shaming that was sort of invented in taking over Sweden. Uh, and the leader for that was obviously Greta Thunberg who started as a protester outside the parliament house in Sweden but actually in 2019 became the Time magazine person of the year. And the effects of this movement actually you know, got domestic air travel to go down 11% in Sweden that year. And this was before COVID. So, uh, and, and at the same time, in many countries in Europe, they worked to permanently ban short haul flights. So, so the governments are, 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 are sort of in on this. It's not just uh, a popular movement, but the governments are also implementing new and new rules. So you find regional travel being in this vicious cycle where where you know, people are flying less because of climate concerns, so they're already struggling to be profitable. Airlines are, you know, it's hurting their bottom lines and their tight margins, and they're shutting down more routes, so the connectivity becomes worse, and then they don't, you know, the, the value proposition of flying becomes less and less, and people shoot so other modes of transport. So we thought that by going electric, we could find this sort of uh, common part in the Venn diagram that could solve all these three things. And in the summer of 2018, we actually had a visit in, uh, in Gothenburg by uh, the, uh, the world's first electric plane, which was two-seater all-electric aircraft. And I actually got to fly that uh, over Gothenburg in the summer of, uh, of 2019. And that really sort of opened up my eyes because it, it showed to me that the technology is already here. Uh, and 
it's not a really a question, you know, there's a lot of research to be done on this technology, but it's not really a research project per se. It's something that we need to scale and get into production and start getting into commercial air travel very, very soon. So I started the company Heart Aerospace, and with the first sort of challenge was really like, how do we get off the ground? How do we get funding to do something like this? Uh, so we applied for a startup accelerator, it's called Y Combinator in, in Silicon Valley, where companies like Airbnb, Dropbox, um, Stripe, uh, DoorDash, Coinbase, a lot of these companies that are doing software got their start, but also increasingly hardware companies like, like Cruise Automation that makes uh, driverless cars, which was mentioned uh, previously, and also... Um, also Boom Supersonic, which was building a supersonic airliner. So we applied for this, and we were one of uh, 12,000 uh, applicants that year, and we were one of the 200 that got in. So that ended up me actually quitting my job here at Chalmers and moving to this small house in Mountain View, California, together with my fiance and, and co-founder, and we started Hard Aerospace. And uh, the, the sort of uh, what we were working towards was on on uh, May or sorry, on March 18th in uh, 2019, we had the opportunity to be on stage on what's called Demo Day, where we could, for two minutes in front of 400 investors, present what we were doing uh, to the world and try to get them to invest in our two-person aerospace company. And what, what, what ha happened was re really great because we went back to Sweden and we spoke to the airlines, so SAS, Bra in Sweden and also Vidra in Norway, and they agreed to write a letter of interest saying that they would support us if we do this and they'd be interested in buying our product. And with this, we raised our first round, uh, what's called the seed round, and we moved back to Sweden to start this company. Uh, and the product was this. It's the Hart ES-19. And it's a 19-passenger aircraft with an all-electric range of about 400 kilometers. And our goal is to have this enter into service in 2026. And for the market in the Nordics, like in Norway, it's a perfect early adopter place because it's not only do they have they adopted uh, uh, electric cars in record numbers, they have also electrified their ferries. And the shortest routes here are 40 kilometers. So even if you take into account, you know, reserve rules, battery degradation, all of these things, we could comfortably fly this with, with, uh, with the technology that was out there today. Uh, in Sweden, we got all of that support from the airlines and we got a lot of, uh, you know, research support, but, but people were saying that, you know, there was actually a governmental investigation in this uh, and, and they were saying that, well, there's actually only one 19-seater aircraft flying in Sweden. So it's not actually that, that, it's not really that big of a climate impact in Sweden. So we were a little bit, you know, disappointed in that, even though we had that support from the airlines that were, you know, seeing it. Uh, but we saw in many, many different places like, uh, like Canada, like northern UK, New Zealand, there was a lot of interest and, and airlines keep writing us these, these, these letters of interest. Um, and also in all Nordic countries, so Iceland, Greenland, Finland, etc. But, uh, and then something sort of interesting happened about a year ago, or a little bit less than a year ago, and that's that we were approached by uh, United Airlines and Mesa Airlines. And these are, as I mentioned, United is one of the largest uh, um, airlines in the world, and they aim to be carbon neutral by 2050, and Mesa is one of the largest operator of regional aircraft in the world. And they called me, and we talked uh, to that CEO of Mesa, and, and I, I asked him, so like, how many 19-seaters do you fly? And he said, well, now we don't fly anybody, any. And we don't know if, like, we don't, there's hardly anybody that does that. But 20 years ago, <laughs> we were the largest operator of 19-seater of aircraft in the world. So... They flew in 1994, they flew several hundreds of 19-seater aircraft across America, serving hundreds of communities that had since lost service. And the average route that they flew was about 172 miles or 270 kilometers, with most route actually being even shorter. So they didn't stop actually flying these planes because of range concerns. That was the least of their concerns. Their concerns with the bad unit economics of the turbines. So 
The, the, the acquisition costs of new jet turbines for small aircraft and the maintenance cost of these turbines, especially when you fly them short routes as they wear according to the thermal cycle and not according to the route length. So they saw this tremendous opportunity to reinvent and reintroduce an infrastructure that had been there in America for a long time. So this is how it looked. So Mesa, for instance, could operate for, for United Express. And uh, so the, the Mesa founder said, you know, they identified our plane as a means to revive an entire passenger market within the United States that unfortunately was lost due to the expenses with the small turboprop aircraft. And the CEO of United has said that it, they, they're interested in this because it represents the next generation of short-haul flight. And everybody knows, you know, that we, we heard in the previous feature that batteries are getting better, technology is improving, and larger gauge aircraft will become more viable. And that's why it's important that we're taking bold steps now instead of waiting for the market to catch up. So this was really, really, uh, for us it was like uh, an incredible moment. And on top of that, getting this climate fund uh, to, to lead our, our round and support this with a large investment. So, th you know, that's, that's all well and good. <laughs> But then it comes to actually building and designing a plane. And that's actually, for a company like ours, that's the hard part, uh, building an aircraft. So as I actually sort of, kind of like the previous picture, I'm going to list some of, some of our strategy uh, towards getting towards this goal. So the first thing that we've been working on is to set a clear goal and a deadline. And we said that we want to have this aircraft in commercial service in 2026. And this is, you know, it's bold, and it's, there's a probability of failure. It's a falsifiable goal. And that's, I think, is very, very important. And when we set these goals, we need to set them in a way that there's a clear, you know, this is Karl Popper and all that, you know, you need to, in order to create something of value, you need to also, there must also be, to be a scenario where you fail. And I think that's really important. And it's also important to set this goal so that, you know when you're making your design decisions that I can't go in, for instance, and build a, a carbon fiber aircraft because I don't have the, the time or resources to do that. So we're building an aluminum aircraft. We're making all of these choices based on this goal. And by having it, I think you know, five years is a long timeline for a project. Seven years is very long. You know, even, even like the Soviet Union had five-year plans and they were, you know, that was a hard thing because the world was changing so quickly. So if you're hearing about, like if, if, if the first goal that people have is to have something in the 2030s or 40s or 50s, I think it's very, very difficult to, to sort of create some sort of momentum around it. Uh, obviously, the thing is to build the right team, and we've been working on that. We've hired people from all over the world to come here. Um, our team has worked on certifying aircraft on five different continents, and um, it's, uh, it's something I generally spend Thursdays to interview my 15 people. Uh, and the other thing, and this is related to that goal, and is to sort of limit the innovation in your first product. I think as our previous speaker said, it's easy to be a startup and a founder and say that, you know, I'm innovative, I can do whatever, uh, and get some hubris. Uh, but we were really, really adamant about that. So we decided that everything that's novel about this plane is going to be inside of the nacelles. So that's where we keep the, the nacelles are the things hanging from the wings, and that's where we keep the, the motors, that's where we keep the batteries, and, you know, everything that's electric about it. Um, and by so, we're minimizing the complexity of our product. We're building a modular product based on a lot of off-the-shelf components that are already there. And with this, we're finding the right suppliers as well. So a lot of the people that we're hiring are actually working as a point of contact to the different suppliers around the world because aircraft are like Lego kits. Uh, and even the large aerospace OEMs, they work with the, uh, uh, the tier one suppliers to deliver things like airframes, avionics systems, uh, flight control systems, etc. And we actually have some very ni uh, nice announcement coming in the coming weeks about some of our supplier selections. And we, we, we're really, really, really proud of this. Um, yeah, another thing that I think is really important is to innovate on process. Um, we are, you know, a lot of people want to design the aircraft of the 21st century, but I think it's as important to look at how do we design the aerospace organization in the 21st century. And you have an opportunity to do this when you're a startup. So one of the things like this, this 
Uh, let's see if I can get this rolling. Okay, uh, this is actually a um, simulation that we did on Amazon Web Services. It's like a very, very massive uh, transient simulation of the entire aircraft with spinning propellers. And we could never have done that as a startup if we weren't using Amazon Web Services, this cloud-based services that's the same as many startups in the IT world are using. And we've also done similar types of setups for, oh, now it's moving here, uh, for, um, for our, our battery testing, etc. So I think this is really important. Um, but also, <laughs> sort of something that you learn from, uh, from, uh, from being a PhD student is really to do your liter literature review. Um, we started actually speaking to the certifying authorities in 2019, where we're a very small company, and we're continuously working with all that to understand actually what the requirements are and how to deal with that, and not sort of guessing ourselves and reinventing the wheel. This also goes actually for how to run a startup. So much of what you learn at Y Combinator is learn to ask for help and look at benchmarks. So what have successful founders done in the past? What have successful companies done in the past? What's the proper way of doing, doing you know, a fundraising round, etc.? So this is really where you become, as a founder, you have to be really ask the stupid questions to a lot of people all the time and build a network of people that you can ask those questions to. Uh, and then we create clear, simple milestones uh, with the, the risk up front. So we said that by 2020, we would build and test a large-scale electric drivetrain, which, uh, which was much larger than the one on the plane that I flew. That, that was actually the size of a small jet engine. And then that was the sort of main risk. Can we prove that we can build a drivetrain? The second risk was to show, or is to show, because this is still in the future, that we can run all the other systems on board the aircraft, flight controls, environmental controls, avionics, probes, all of this stuff with uh, de-icing systems, which is really important, with electric power as the main source or the only source of energy. And that we can do that in a way that's not only safe and re reliable, uh, but also that it's efficient so that we're not losing range uh, on our aircraft because we have to run all of these other systems. Only after that is when we build a flight test aircraft. This is work that's being done with all these suppliers. And then after a two-year flight testing campaign, we will have to have this enter into service. So this is a very, very aggressive milestone, but I'll show you some of the progress we've made so far. So we started w with the build and test of the uh, drivetrain. So essentially, as I told you, all the innovation uh, in, in this product is inside of the nacelle. So we decided actually to build a part of the wing with the nacelle as a flight test and have it like this. And we thought that we could actually prove everything that we needed to prove about the propulsion system uh, like this. And here's some video of this thing that we built. I don't know if there's any sound. All power. So this is a 400 kilowatt motor that's capable of giving about 2.3 uh, kilonewton meters or 2.3 thousand newton meters of torque, the size of a small uh, turbofan jet engine. And we built this with a small team and a select few suppliers uh, in the span of about five months. And uh, it is about 97% efficient. Uh, when it comes to the sort of from the battery to the shaft, uh, so the motor is 97% efficient and the the mo the motor controller is 99.5% efficient, and that's only our first iteration of this. Uh, and obviously, uh, so so this is what I think it's it's a testament to is not only that you know we're super innovative and all of this stuff and we're we're good engineers, but also that this technology is drastically simpler. A jet engine is something that takes, and I used to work, like my PhD was about jet engines, um, and it's something that takes thousands of people, decades, and billions of dollars to develop, and this was developed by a small startup. And this is important not because of costs, right? Because this 
a simple product like this will have a low cost and that will translate to better unit economics, those things that we need for the consumer. So the price of this one electric motor is about 1 20th, 1 30th of an equivalent jet engine. And you know it's virtually uh, no maintenance. Uh, and as for the batteries, they're roughly on par with what it costs to, to use jet fuel today. Uh, and so, but we're not done here. We're continuously iterating on this design. It's about you know creating better performance. I think actually the performance goals are pretty good as they are. But also you know getting the weight down, uh, building a certifiable uh, motor motor controller, uh, doing this uh, you know both from the software, electronics, hardware perspective. It's, it's a massive challenge. But the fact that we have this this um, this uh, really f fast iteration loop is really helpful to us. And my final suggestion <laughs> is to keep it simple. And maybe, you know, I'm talking about this like it's really, really, you know, you, you, using, you, talking about it very, very uh, uh, sort of simply. And you can, might think, hey, wait a minute, isn't aerospace very difficult? And, you know, uh, it is, <laughs> and, and we not need to keep it simple, not because it's easy to build, build aerospace components, but because it's very hard. So if we have that complexity, that, that, that difficulty uh, in doing this, we should not add voluntary complexity uh, by, for instance, creating hard to understand communication, by creating architectures that are hard to design. So like, we really need to be adamant about keeping it simple. Um, and that's actually the words of Kelly Johnson, who you're seeing here, who's the, wor uh, who's the organizer of the sort of KISS principle, and also the, the, f the father of Lock Lockheed Skunk Works and the SR-71, which is, I think, the most advanced uh, aircraft ever built. So with that said, uh, thank you for all for, for uh, listening to me, and I hope that Elizabeth uh, or uh, Nassessi has some questions. <laughs> Anders Forslund, everyone. <laughs> Wonderful to get a little update on your life. <laughs> uh, I'm going to start off with an easy question, I hope. Can you tell us about the name Heart Aerospace? Where does that come from? Whoa. Uh, <laughs> actually, my, my, uh, it's a long story. My, my, my CTO asked me, does this stand for Hybrid Electric Aircraft for Regional Transport? Uh, and I said, no. <laughs> uh, but it's a long story. And uh, at one point, we were actually, uh, yeah. Maybe well, you can write it on the I'll website. I'll tell you over a beer, yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> we have some uh, more, uh, less lighthearted questions also. Mm. One is, do we need to get so many people to move in the world? What is the second order environmental effects of mining lithium in other parts of the world, like Bolivia and not in Sweden or Nordic countries? Okay, so that's two questions. Ish, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, no, I think that, that, that it's, I, I think we've, we've seen, it's been a social experiment kind of for the past, past year about what it means to not travel and uh, and I think we've seen that maybe some parts of it we can actually do online but for most people it's an essential service. For people in, in Norway for instance they, there's no good options to taking a plane um, and they see it as a really de de democracy issue and as for let's say my, um, mining that's obviously nothing that you should be sort of too cavalier about but um, what we're excited about about airplanes is that this plane has roughly the same amount of ba batteries as, as eight Tesla cars, and and it can, if we transport 19 people and do that 10 times a day, that's like 200 person transport almost every every day, whereas eight Tesla cars mostly stand around in their owners' driveways. So it's a really high utilization rate of this lithium, but also we're seeing you know companies like Northvolt in Sweden that are building, you know, the world's greenest battery pack, etc. Mm. Yeah, it's an exciting crossroads, I believe. Another question, are there already clearly defined safety-related regulatory requirements for commercial electric flight, or do you still have to kind of guess what these will be? Yeah, I think that, so first of all, I forgot to say something very important when we were talking about, about you know, our, our timeline and our goal and also our, our complexity is that we're building something called, uh, we're, the, the reason that we have 19 passengers is that it's, it's a different certification brackets than if you go 20 above. So up to 19 people, that's where you know those those aircraft generally take like three to five years to build. Whereas if you go twenty and above, it generally costs like three to five times as much and take three times as long. Uh, so that's one of the reasons we're saying there. And you, as I saw that aircraft that I flew in 2018, which was actually an experimental aircraft by then, it's now certified. And if you go to the flight school in 
In, uh, in uh, Seava here, you can actually learn how to fly on an electric aircraft. So a lot of that certification framework, the ASA special condition on, on electric motors, etc., is out there. Uh, there's still some things that are changing, and, uh, but, but all in all, we know fairly well what we need to do. Okay. I think we have time for a last question from the chat. Are you envisioning autonomous electric and simple planes like these in the near future? Um, I, I, yeah, so, so there's a lot of people that are, you know, there's several revolutions in the aerospace that people are working about, uh, working on. It's like vertical takeoff and landing, autonomy, um, electric propulsion, and also sort of new types of air traffic management and new types of infrastructure. And we decided specifically as a strategy that we were only going to do one. Like we pick one, and then when we show that we can do that, uh, maybe we can start, you know, addressing some of the, these others. But uh, but so I definitely see that it's happening, but it's, it's also kind of like with electric cars. It's, it's, it's actually less difficult than with electric cars because everything in the air is an obstacle um, that you need to avoid. Uh, but, uh, but it's something that's, that's coming along as well. Hmm. I'll actually throw in a bonus question. <laughs> Are you hiring? Am I hiring? Yes. Go to hardairspace.com and look for your new job. <laughs> uh, we're, we're hiring intensely, and uh, we want to be about 300 people out uh, at SEVA by the uh, by 2025 2026 so well i wish you a bright future with this exciting uh, trajectory everyone anders forslund thank you that concludes this keynote